3.46. Time is filled with swift transition. Naught of earth on who shall stand. Build your hopes on things eternal. Oh, to God's unchanging hand. Everybody ought to hold to a Hold on to God's unchanging. Everybody ought to hold to his hand. God's unchanging hand. Build your hopes on things eternal. Hold on to God's unchanging hand. Trust in him who will not leave you. Whatsoever years may bring, if my earthly friends forsaken, still more closely to him cling. All brothers on the whole to uh, hold on to God. All brothers ought to hold on, hold on to God. We ought to build our hopes on things eternal. Hold on to God's unchanging hand. Covet not this world's vain riches. That so rapidly decay. Seek to gain the heavenly treasure. For they will never pass away. All sisters ought to hold to and hold on to. All sisters ought to hold on and hold on to God. You ought to build their hopes on things eternal. Hold on to God's unchanging hand. When your journey is completed, if to God you have been true, found and bright the home in glory. You're enraptured, so shall view. All children ought to hold on, hold on to God. All children ought to hold on, hold on to God. You ought to build. Your hopes on things eternal. Oh, to God's unchanging hand. Everybody on a whole. Hold on. Hold on to God. You ought to build your hopes on things eternal. Hold on to God's unchanging hand. Everybody ought to hold on. Hold on to God's unchanging Isn't it good to be in the house of the Lord, a house of prayer, the church of Christ, God's kingdom, his people? Isn't that wonderful to be able to say thank you, Jesus, for all that you have meant to us?
Y'all can say amen anytime you want to. It's good to be back home. It's good to look out and see all the smiling faces, and, and especially those who, uh, uh, who uh, knew we were gone and missed us. And, and uh, uh, it's all right. It's really, uh, it's really good to have uh, gotten away. My blood pressure just went shh. And uh, that was really, really good. The doctor, the nurse, didn't believe it. And uh, so she said, uh, uh, I got to do this again because your history says this. And then she said, no, you can't sit down. You got to stand up and take this one. And so I stood up, and she took it. She says, even better than the other one. And uh, uh, y'all know what I'm saying, right? Uh, do it again, do it again, you know, go uh, again. No, y'all didn't get it. You're going to get there later. But I, 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 am, I am so uh, enthralled with the fact that God is still on the throne and that he is the uh, Savior of the world. And all we have to do is just... Uh, accept the fact that Jesus Christ is the Messiah and that he is the one who makes life possible for us in the midst of all of the chaos and all of the problems and all of the issues of life. And even though you may have uh, economic, social, educational success, somehow it still doesn't give you peace of mind this young man who shot his girlfriend and then shot himself just didn't have peace didn't have a relationship with God and so in the past year or so the last couple of years we have come across some very angry people angry with God because I'm not getting what I want and doing what I want to do. And so we need to be aware uh, that uh, our hope is only in God and that our salvation is dependent upon our commitment to him and our relationship with him. This is a beautiful day. It's going, hopefully it will rain. Uh, It has rained some and God has brought us some uh, needed moisture and uh, don't 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 complain because you could be in Sandy uh, what God is doing for us is God's will and so it's it's just really good to be uh, to be here I uh, so many things that we want to announce especially the men we need you to register for uh, the men's empowerment conference. I was told that I hadn't registered, so did it show up, Doc? Did it show up? It showed up. Yeah, I, I, I did it. And uh, so sign up. Thank you. Yeah, he did it. And then uh, we're looking forward to uh, the two men, to two brothers who are going to come next week and. Uh, this weekend and to deliver uh, lessons uh, that has to do with fear. And then uh, I want to uh, invite you all to come back at 5 o'clock. There's a young man here who is going to speak at 5, and I'm, I'm anxiously waiting for him to come and to deliver the message and many of you know him or have seen him many of you may not know him but he's here this morning and I and I want him to stand uh, I, his name just slipped me but that's all right you'll know him Roberto is from Sydney Australia and he's going to be delivering our message tonight and we're glad Roberto that you are here and we look forward. I'm making him nervous. I love it. Uh, and, and, and so we want to have a real packed crowd. Uh, that would make you more nervous, isn't that right, Roberto? But that's all right. You are speaking from God's word. And when you stand 
uh, behind the cross, then the words of the Master will be uh, implanted in our minds. Uh, we'll see you at 5 uh, for those of you who are not going to stay for Bible class. Uh, I shouldn't say that because all of y'all should stay for Bible class. And uh, there's nothing like studying the Word. And there are classes for everybody. And, uh, but the sad part, let me, let me get my fussing out of the way. I'm back home now, so I can go back to fussing. Let me, let, let me say, for those of you who, no matter what we say, ain't going to stay for Bible class, at least you ought to give us the parking slot. Amen. At least, at least do that. Uh, you know, I know it's good to visit, but uh, it, once the service is over, and there are those who are coming for Bible study, uh, and you're sitting there talking to your neighbors and acting as if uh, there's plenty of room. It ain't. Uh, excuse my language. It ain't. We don't have enough room and enough parking slots for everybody. And so number one, stay for Bible study. Number two, uh, give up your parking slot if you don't. Is that all right? Is that a deal? Yeah, all right. Then uh, we, we appreciate that so much. Genesis chapter 25. Uh, Genesis 25. And uh, I want to read a, a few verses beginning with verse 19. Uh, Genesis 25. Uh, for those of you who are flipping pages, it's the first book in the Bible. <laughs> Amen. Uh, yeah, just go left. And when you get to the end of the Bible, that's it. Genesis 25. Uh, in the 19th verse, it, and it says, This is the account of Abraham's son, Isaac. Abraham became the father of Isaac. And Isaac was 40 years old when he married Rebekah, daughter of Bethuel, the Aramean from Padam Aram, and sister Laban the Aramean. Isaac, Isaac prayed to the Lord on behalf of his wife because she was barren. And the Lord answered his prayer, and his wife Rebekah became pregnant. The babies... This is the verse that I want to uh, uh, center on. The babies jostled each other within her. And she said, why is this happening to me? So she went to inquire of the Lord. The Lord said to her, two nations are in your womb, and two peoples from within you will be separated one people will be stronger than the other, and the older will serve the younger. In your spare time, I'd like for you to read the rest of the chapter. But I want to center on this verse that when the children, in another translation said, and the children struggled together within her. And she said, if it be so, why am I thus? And she went to inquire of the Lord. When the family struggles, has there ever been a time when your family was not at peace? Uh, most families have experienced a few times when there was dissension in the family. Families generally consist of collections of individual personalities and goals and ambitions. On occasion, those personalities, those ambitions and goals collide, especially if they are not the same. They also collide when personalities of equal vigor meet. It is not unusual for uh, any family to experience internal struggle. It is expected, however, 
that Christian families resolve struggles in the light of God's word. And there are many families today that are divided and broken because of bad feelings that have divided them over the years. Angry families hold grudges for years, and they treat blood relatives like outcasts and sometimes worse than strangers. It's a part, it's all a part of what is known as the family feud. Y'all know that television program? Uh, family feud appears to be a simple game where everybody leaves smiling. And the host introduced two families that are all smiling and they're cheering and they're hugging and kissing each other as they play against another friendly family for prizes and for awards. But in real life, in real life, family feuds ain't no fun. Sometimes they continue from generation to generation. Anybody ever heard of this long feud that took place between the Hatfields and the McCoys? It hit the newspaper in the uh, 1880s when the Hatfield clan feuded with the McCoy clan from across the border in Kentucky. Historians disagree on the cause which captured the imagination of the nation during a 10-year run. As many as 100 men, women, and children died in this feud. In May 1976, Jim McCoy and Willis Hatfield, and the last two participated in a ceremony dedicating a monument to six of the victims. McCoy, according to history, died February the 11th, 1984. He was 99 years old. He bore no grudges. He had his burial uh, handled by the Hatfield Funeral Home in Tola, Kentucky. There's a great... Uh, disagreement among Christians as to which of them would get a special honor in the kingdom. James and John sought special favors from Christ. The seeds of a bitter rivalry were sown, and they were quickly dispelled by the master. His message to them and his message to us today is that God loves us all and gives favor to whomever he pleases. And he can do it any way he wants to do it and to whomever he loves to do it too. As Christians, we have learned to love our brothers and sisters and family members as well. It is shown by how we celebrate their accomplishments it is shown by how we mourn their failures. And ultimately, we give God the praise and we give God the glory. The text that I read focuses on a family struggle that began in the mother's womb and continued for many years. Rebecca is a snapshot of many mothers in many ways. She was young, she was beautiful. She was devout and faithful to her husband, industrious and protective of her children. She was the sister of Laban, married to Isaac. She is first presented in Genesis chapter 24 and verse 1, where the beautiful story of her marriage is related. For 19 years, she was without a child. Then Esau and Jacob were born, the younger one being the mother's companion and favorite. She demonstrated great faith when she never gave up hope. 
that she would bear our children even after 19 years of failed efforts. But if she was a woman of great faith, when it came to one of her children, she proved herself capable of devious means to assist him in gaining a foothold in life. It was Rebecca who suggested the deceit that was practiced by Jacob on his blind father. So while carrying Jacob and Esau, Rebecca was troubled by an unusual movement within her womb. She had no idea what was going on and, and, and they could not, and it could not be explained by the midwives and it could not be explained by the women who assisted her. Her husband, Isaac, asked God to bless his wife with a child in verse 21. And the Lord answered, by allowing her to conceive but not one child, but to have two. And, and this unusual movement prompted Rebecca to question whether or not her pregnancy was a blessing or a curse. She said, if it be so, then what's going on with me? If this is the case, why is this happening? If this is a blessing from God, uh, which explains the complicated struggle going on inside of her. How could it be a blessing? She could feel the intensity of the moment. And she sensed within her a, 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 an atmosphere of battle. If a condition was of God, blessed and sanctioned by God, she wondered, if this is from God, then why am I? Thus, for an answer she asked God, and he answered back and gave her peace. She was told that she was carrying twins, and both of them would be the fathers of great nations that would struggle and compete with each other over generations. Two nations are in their, their womb, and two manner of people shall be separated from the bowels, and, and, and the one people shall be stronger than the other, and the elder shall serve the younger. And, and, and from the outset, Rebecca felt the life struggle of her children. It, it, it was abnormal. It was unusual. And she wondered how she could be a recipient of a blessing from God if such abnormal activity was a part of her being. No one else could feel what she felt. So when Rebecca talked to God, she received an answer that helped her to understand the children she would bear and her role in the process. And, and of course, look at this passage that surrounds the text paints a clear picture of how this family began its struggles. In, in, in many instances, it bears a, a close resemblance to the development of struggles within our own family. In, in Genesis 25 and verse 20 and 21, you can see a husband praying for his wife. When Isaac was 40 years old, he buried Rebecca. He lived with her for 19 years without any children. And concerned about that lack of children, he entreated the Lord for his wife. Isn't that a good thing? Man to be praying for his wife. You don't wait until she gets sick. You don't wait until she gets despondent. You don't wait until things start going bad. You pray for your wife all the time. And no matter what happens in that relationship, pray for her. I, I, I'm only getting two or three amens from brothers. Maybe I should talk to sisters. Don't that man, doesn't that man, shouldn't that man pray for you all the time? Shouldn't he pray for you uh, in the morning, in the evening, 
Shouldn't he just, shouldn't he just pray for his wife? And, 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 and so this man went to God and, and talked to God about his wife. Even today there are situations that will stress your home, that will stress your marriages. And we should pray and seek God's direction. Just as he answered Isaac, he'll answer you as well. And when we stop asking God for a help in our relationships, no wonder they fall apart. No wonder things go down the tube. It is because we want to do it ourselves. And we don't have any relationship with God that helps us when things go wrong. Then there's another problem that, that they had in verse 22. The babies were struggling in the room, in the womb. I, I know children struggle. We have problems with struggling children. And the word used for struggle is ye roll stop smooth. Now, if I said that wrong, you had to know what was right to determine whether I said it wrong. Amen. That makes sense. And so let's just assume that I said it right. Uh, and, and, and when y'all look it up, then you can come back and tell me that I got it right or I got it wrong. And, and, and the meaning of this is that they dashed against or bruised each other. There was some violent agitation. And so the mother was apprehensive, both of her own and her children's safety. And Rebecca sensed. That something different was happening. And, and, and uh, aren't you aware that parents who are observant should be able to notice the differences in their children? Those of you who have more than one, can you tell the difference? Mothers know when there is a difference between their children and they are not the same as each seeks her own, her own identity. God and good parents should follow the example of Rebecca and consult God for answers. Uh, I don't think my boys are here today. I, I know Tony may be here at, a, at 11, and since he, I'm looking to see if he's here. Uh, I don't see him, but he, uh, he's different from Michael. <laughs> Amen. And, and, and you can't treat them all the same way. I, 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 one borrows money and forget that he got it the moment it touches his hand. Amen. I guess y'all don't understand. And, and, and the other one, you give it to him, he promises to pay you back. Five years later, he's still paying you back. But, you know, there are some differences. There are differences between children. And, and they struggle with each other. They struggle with their own identity. They struggle, and, and, and the same principle happens with children in the church. And then, and then they have, in, in, in verse 23, they have different destinies. Rebecca sought an explanation for the dilemma in her womb. And she learned that the children she bore had different and unique destinies. They were designed to father two great nations. Biblical scholars agree that what was predicted concerning Esau and Jacob was not verified in themselves, but in their posterity. The Edomites were the offspring of Esau and the Israelites of Jacob. And the same is true today. Every child is a family in a unique destiny of his or her own. And often we try to shape that destiny by forcing our children to become doctors and lawyers and some professionals with a high earning potential only to find that our children have dreams of their own. And when they are forced to go against their own dreams, they struggle. They struggle. I grew up, when I was born, I was left-handed. Still left-handed. But some people in my family thought that was a curse and wanted me to retrain and, and, and learn to use my right hand so that I could be just like everybody else. And then uh, families struggle. Families struggle in naming their children. At, at, in verse 24, at, at birth, twins were born. And the word for twins is thomim. And, and, and just accept the fact that I got that one right too, which comes, which comes from Thomas properly interpreted by the Greek word dimas, which uh, signifies a twin. 
And so the first person who was called Thomas or Demas, we take for granted that his name, from the circumstance of being a twin, the children were named Jacob and Esau. And the giving of the names in the ancient world was a significant act. A name was believed to affect a person's destiny. And so the person given the name was exercising some degree of control over that person's future. One of the twins was named one of the twins was named Esau. And the name means to take a firm, a hard hand, and also come to a man's estate. It means to grow old. And probably he had this name from his appearing to be more perfect, to be more together, to be more robust. Uh, and, and, and than his brother. And the other one named Jacob, which means to defraud and deceptive, to supplant, to overthrow a person by tripping up his heels. And the name also describes a person who dogs another steps. And this name was given to Jacob because it was found there laid on his brother's heel, which is emblematic of his supplanting Esau and defrauding him of his birthright. And when we name our children, the names should have some significance. And, and, you know, when today most of us, it appears that names have no significance. Usually we name them because they're cute, unique. We name our children because it's a long name, oddly spelled, but have no meaning. And when children ask why they were given their names, their parents should be prepared to tell them that name, what that name represents. Now, y'all wait on me for a minute. Because when you are buried in water and come up out of that watery grave of baptism, you got a new name. You are now a Christian. And when you are a Christian, you ought to be able to tell everybody what that means. When I become a child of God, what does that mean? And then there's divided love. Two boys are different. Uh, my time is running out. Squandering the inheritance. Uh, the text shows Esau traded his inheritance uh, rights for a bowl of partridge. And the birthright concerned only the material inheritance from the parents. And the inheritance was divided into the number of sons plus one. And the eldest son then received a double share. This was a customary practice throughout the ancient Near East. And when Esau traded his right to receive a double portion of the inheritance, not his entire inheritance, he still kept his authority and superiority over the rest of the family. Reception of the family's blessings. Position next in honor to the parents. In essence, many of us stopped talking to each other for years because of disputes over divisions of properties left by their parents. Now, I don't know about you, but I want to tell you what I'm going to do. No, I'm not going to tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to tell you what I am doing. I am going to spend everything I got. <laughs> so that those boys don't sit back and wait. And deep down inside saying, when he going to die? We spoil our children sometimes by, by saying, I'm going to leave you this and I'm going to leave you that. I'm going to leave you this and I'm going to leave you that. My daddy left me nothing but a desire to work. Well, if he had something, he probably would have left it, but he didn't have nothing. And sometimes we do this with our children. We mess them up because we have them divided against each other. One don't like the other. One is doing better than the other. One is going greater. One is going bad. We ought to stand up and say, this is the direction that you ought to be going. And that is Jesus Christ. Let me, con let me conclude. Let me conclude that when no, uh, there are no struggles in God's family. Brothers and sisters. 
we must learn from this text. There should be no struggles in the family of God. Sibling rivalry exists because children want to outdo each other for a special favor. And when it comes to our spiritual relationship, many of us feel that we must compete for blessings from God. James and John, two of the disciples of Christ, lobbied for a good position in the kingdom of heaven above their comrades. And their request caused dissension in the group, but it was denied by Christ who reminded them that all blessings are given by God for his own reasons. Now, everything you got is a blessing from God. And if you don't have anything, it is because God chose not to give it to you. Amen. Now, I don't know what's going to happen to those people who won that lottery. But personalities change when money comes, when position comes. I'm now somebody, and you are not identified by what you have, what you got, what you're going to get. You are identified by who you belong to. And my father and mother, who were poor farmers, said to us, no matter what you do, don't disgrace this family. Children do not disgrace the house of God are not divided against each other because of ideology and because of whatever it is that I personally want to do. God is the head of his church. He is the savior of the body. He is the one who makes the decisions. You know, there are, there are some adults who are still trying to get themselves high praise from God by outdoing somebody else. I'm going I'm to preach better than Tyson. I'm going to preach better than Tom. I'm going to preach better than Barnes. I'm going to sing better than Paul. Forget it. Ain't nothing better than somebody who is dedicated to God. And no matter how good you may be or how bad you may be, you are judged by God on your faithfulness. And your commitment to him, that's where your salvation lies. It is in your commitment to Christ Jesus. And, and God and God gives us a perfect model. He does not de de bestow grace upon us because we have outdone somebody else. But he, does, he, he bestows grace on us because he loves us. And there's nothing we have to do to earn it. We don't have to be the head of anything. Or we don't have to be over anything. We don't have to be in front of anything. He'll do for us simply because he loves us. In the same sense, every, every parent should create an atmosphere in the home where competition between children are unnecessary. It should be an atmosphere that accepts the value and, and, and the worth and the contribution of each family member that is both recognized and appreciated in his own merits. We should try as best as we can to love as God loves, and that is with unmerited grace. So I'm, I'm closing now. When I say that I was reminded of the little girl and her brother who had argued all day long about First one thing or another. They never seemed to get along. She got so mad at him one day, she screamed at him and said, I wish you were dead. Upset him so much that he ran out in the cold. Lost and alone. The brother shivered, shivered in the cold. And as time passed, it became obvious that something was wrong. And the little girl decided to go looking for her brother and ran out into the blizzard, calling his name as she went. And she finally found him, reached down, moved the snow off his body, reached down and picked him up, put him on her back, and walked against the wind to get him back home. She staggered under his weight, 
But step by step, she continued home. And she made it to the house of the village doctor, still holding him on her back. And, and the doctor rushed to her and said, I know he must be heavy. And the little girl said, he ain't heavy. He's my brother. That's the kind of love that Jesus showed for us when he bore that old rugged cross up yonder on Calvary and with blood-stained brow and whip marks on his back. He carried the cross to make it plain what real love was all about, that he would lay down his life for his friend. Y'all know that when he died, those that he died for were cursing him. Those that he died for were whipping him. Those who died, that he died for, they talked about him. They put him down. And he actually was saying, they don't even know who I am and what I'm all about. But when he got up from the grave, all power in his hands, they knew. Now what must I do to get out from under the task and the problem of what I've done? And Jesus basically sent his disciples and said, his apostles and said, repent and be baptized for the remission of your sins. And he will add you to his church. That's how you get out from under the burden. Have you been playing games with your brothers and sisters? Is there a problem with your relationship with your, with your mother and father? Then repent. Get out from under the burden. Because you can't do nothing in and of yourself. It is somebody who has a higher power than you to make it right. And that's God. And if you're not a Christian, let me tell you the best way to, the best way to make it in life, in this life, is to be a child of God. Because he can keep your mind in perspective. You won't have to be like that rich football player who couldn't get along with his girlfriend, shot her and then shot himself. There's a disconnect. And so those of you who are rich here, praise God. Because God has gifted you. Those of you who ain't, praise God. God has gifted you as well. Don't put people down because they got something. Don't put people down because, excuse my language, because they ain't got nothing. We're all children of God. We're all one big family. We all got to work together in the kingdom of God. And when I came, when I came home after messing up, walked in this house, Daddy said, I want to tell you something, son. I want to tell you something. This ain't your house. Now you get back out there and clean yourself up. Go clean up your mess and then you come back. If you've got a problem in your life with your brother or your sister, your mother or your father, clean it up and then come on back to the house of the Lord. I see somebody who's dropping their heads. You know, you know that relationship is no good. You know you need to straighten it up, but you've got to start with God first. There are people who say, uh, when, I, when I get this right, I'm going to come to the Lord. When I get this right, I'm going to come to the Lord. Why don't you get help first? I'm, I'm, I'm going to come to the Lord, and he's going to help me go get my stuff right. <laughs> somebody here, somebody here, somebody here, as you stand on your feet, as you stand on your feet, somebody here needs to walk down this aisle. Somebody here needs to put him on in baptism. Somebody here, somebody here, somebody here really needs him. Somebody here needs to make it right. We don't want you to stand where you are. We want you to come down front. We want you to come so that we can be, uh, hold your hand, that we can look you in the eye, that we can talk to you, that we'll be able to say to you that uh, we have people who can pray for you. Come down right now while we sing. This As song. a fountain free, tis for you and me. Let us haste, oh haste, to the brink. Tis a fount of love from the source above, and He bids us all freely drink. 
Will you come to the fountain free? Will you come? Tis for you and me, thirsty soul. Hear the well come call. Tis a fountain open for all. There's a living stream with a crystal gleam from the throne of life. Now it flows while the waters roll. Let the weary soul hear the call that forth freely goes. Will you come to the fountain? Ten free, will you come? Tis for you and me, thirsty soul. Hear the well come call. Tis a fountain open for all. As a living well, and its waters swell, and eternal life they can give. And we joyful sing, ever spring, oh spring, as we haste to drink and to live. Will you come to the fountain?